Jim Mayo. I'm director of the Military Museum here in Gastonia, which is part of the American Legion post-23 here in Gastonia. We're located in Memorial Hall on 2nd Avenue. I've been associated with American Legion for the last 15 years. A friend of mine is Bobby Thomas. Uh, I knew him for quite a while. And oh, I guess 15, 20 years. He kept talking about American Legion, American Legion. And so. uh, I worked with him at Covenant Village. In fact, he took over my job at Covenant Village, which he's retired from there now himself. I said, all right, so. Bobby got me signed up over here, and I've been here ever since and just enjoyed it. But uh, back in 2004, um, Charlie Wetzel, who was the director of the military museum for many, many years, passed away. And it was just a lot of talk about who was going to do this and who was going to do that. And so I said, I'll take care of it. So I've been connected with this right at, since 2005 and uh, enjoy every minute of it. Most everything we have here at the uh, museum has been donated by somebody here in Gaston County. The young folk that come in here, like from the schools and even just come in here, you know, in their teens and all, have no idea um, how much the women did in World War II. I mean, and the women, there was a lot of women in World War II, lots of them. Of course, there was a lot here because there wasn't hardly any men here. But, um, we had to uh, make a display here of the wax and the waves because they were nurses and different things. They, they flew airplanes, not combat, but they flew airplanes uh, for supplies and, you know, whatever. And in, the, in this one display here, we put a, um, a Yank magazine, didn't know who she was. And one Sunday afternoon, this lady and man came in, they were on a trip from Ohio. They weren't here five minutes, and I heard, oh my goodness. I said, oh Lord, I haven't been here long. What is wrong? So I came in and she said, do you know that lady? She said, well, I know who she is. I said, you do? She said, yep. She lives in a nursing home across the street from my house. From my house. I said, yeah, really? She said, yeah. Well, I'll tell you about this one right here, Charlie Wetzel. And he was here for years and years and years. You know, and he went to the Citadel and he was a captain in the army when he got out. But when he was a lieutenant, he got wounded. And they claim what really saved him, but he still got hurt real bad, was a can of beans up here in his field jacket. And you can hear him laughing when he would tell you when he had his hand up here, something was running down here, you know? And he said, oh, me, my insides are running down there, you know? It wasn't his insides, it was the can of beans running down there. It was funny, he always laugh about that. When he got wounded, the sergeant that was with him killed the German, took the German's gun home. 30 years later, of course, he didn't know if Charlie lived or died, because, you know, they took him out. and. Thirty years later, they had a reunion, and both the guys went up. And the sergeant told Charlie that he had something at home that he needed to have, and he brought him the gun that wounded him. And it's here in Charlie's display. Interesting. But militarily. Um, I was in my senior year in high school and I decided to join the Air National Guard. 
I went into service. I quit high school in 11th grade in 1951. That's when I went into service. I turned 17 on Sunday and left on Monday for California. I'd have my dad sign for me. He, uh, he said, why do you want to go? That's the toughest outfit. And I said, well, that's why, you know. Actually, when I was a young child, I, I got a little bullied, so I thought, well, I'll join the Marine Corps. They'll teach me how to fight, and that'll never happen again, you know. I made a mistake. Marine Corps doesn't teach people how to fight. They teach them how to kill. That's the purpose of war. My first three years in the uh, Air Guard, well, real normal. Um, we had meeting, you know, once a month, and two weeks in the summertime, we went to a different base. But when, where I joined up was up in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, and two weeks in the summertime, usually we went to Otis Air Force Base on Cape Cod or to Westover Air Force Base in, out near Springfield, Mass. From boot camp, uh, at that time we'd go to ITR, which is Infantry Training Regiment, some more combat training. Then I spent some time at Camp Lejeune with Mike Three Stitch, which is Mike Company, 3rd Battalion, 6 Marines. And uh, there I was a radio operator. October 1st, we flew out. And we left Westover Air Force Base. And first stop was in Iceland. When we landed in Iceland, it was freezing cold, wind was blowing, and the snow was blowing. And it was just a fuel stop because the next stop was in Presswick, Scotland. So we couldn't go anywhere. We were all sleeping on the floor, sleeping in chairs, you know. But in, in one respect, it was a lot of fun, you know. So we couldn't go anywhere until the next day, it was snow at least quit and they got the runways open. And so we flew to Presswick, Scotland, got more fuel, and then flew to Frankfurt, Germany. Put us on a bus. The only thing we knew, we were in Germany, but they didn't tell us where we were going. So they put us all on the bus and went to a little town called Giebelstadt. We pulled into an old German air base. Giebelstadt, not on the maps in Germany. They may be now, but it wasn't back during World War II, and even after World War II. The, uh, the base that we went to was Hitler's secret air base. Well, his secret airplanes that he was, you know, putting together and all, they all flew out of there. And he took Griegelstadt off the map because he didn't want anybody to know where it was. So they couldn't just come in and, you know, bomb the place. But eventually the British found out and knocked it out. When we pulled in to this old base, the German army was out there digging up bombs that didn't go off. They just, you know, went into the dirt or into the mud or anywhere or whatever. And, um, said, man, this is going to be something. And um, slept in old German barracks. No floor. Built on, you know, four walls, doors, some windows, no floor on the ground. And our maintenance people that were with us went through all the barracks and put floors in. And to go to the latrine, you had to go outside to another building. Cold, mercy, and rained most of the time we were over there. And it was cold. Had a big swimming pool there, but you couldn't use it. It was just nasty cold. And uh, we were, uh, my outfit was the 101st Aircraft Control Warning Flight. We were a radar unit, and it was mobile, so we could, you know, pretty much go anywhere. But why they didn't tell us where we were going, I don't know. Maybe we figured we all run away. <laughs> so we were over there for a, for a year, and finally got back to the States, and um, got 
discharged from Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. And then put us on buses again all the way back, well, to Worcester, not back here, but to Worcester. And uh, let's see, we get out in July and November. <clears throat> they put me on standby. Didn't have to go to any meetings or anything else. So they kind of gave us almost a year for going over. So we didn't have to do anything from that point on. I went on active duty in uh, January of 1963 at Aberdeen, Maryland. I uh, was at Aberdeen, Maryland for six months and received orders to go to Germany in uh, June of 1963. I spent uh, almost a year in uh, Mannheim, Germany, and I was transferred to Verdun, France. I took my wife uh, to Germany with me at government expense. So I changed my status from what's called OVB2, which was obligation for two years only, to voluntary indefinite, which means I was at the disposal of our president. And I received orders to go to Fort Lewis, Washington after 30 days leave, and I was assigned to the 548 Light Maintenance Company for further assignment to an overseas area, non-dependent. So I knew where I was going. Uh, finally was transferred to, uh, to uh, Vietnam in uh, late June of uh, 1966. And uh, it was quite a eye-opener when, when I finally got there. My, you know, I was 18 years old at that time, which in a war is fought by teenagers. The average age of a uh, veteran from Vietnam when, when they were there was 19 years old. And so that's still pretty young. That's, uh, that's underdeveloped frontal lobes. <laughs> and, uh, but it finally occurred to me I was someplace where, I, you know, some people are getting killed here. And during the transition from uh, Europe during the month of May of 1966 until June, I was promoted from first lieutenant to captain. And I was picked up. I didn't know I was promoted. I knew it was on the list. I was picked up by the acting company commander who was a second lieutenant. Oh, actually, he was a first lieutenant at the airport. And he said, I said to him, I said, now what's my job going to be? He said, well, you're the company commander. Surprise. So we were, I reported into the unit and found out the unit was all packed and ready to go. We had 37 vehicles that were already packed and all the personal gear was already, pa already packed. And when I checked in, they said, well, we're 25 guys short of what we're supposed to have. And they're due in in the next couple of weeks. And then they have to have some training. So we finally ended up uh, leaving the country on August 1st of 1966. Up to that time, it was just an adventure. But when I, I got to Da Nang, I spent the first night there in a tent by the runway and listened to F-4s take off all night. And then uh, just a few days later, I was up in Dong A near the DMZ and uh, got assigned to a uh, squad again as a radio operator. And, and I did that for a while. And finally, I became the captain's radio operator. Uh, which was which good duty, to, and uh, I didn't have to do a lot of things the guys in the squads did. But uh, after a while, I, I uh, wanted to be with the guys in the squad, rather than kind of safe and sound. At, uh, it's not really safe, count, safe and sound, but relatively. So I requested a reassignment, and I was made a fire team leader, and from there a squad leader. And there were 139 of us that went over. And uh, we had temporary set up uh, at Long Bend, waiting for our own equipment to come in, the 37 vehicles and all of our other equipment to come in. Well, it finally came in in October. But during that period, we found out we were going to Phu Loi, Vietnam, 
which is north and west of Saigon. And uh, so we began to set up our camp up there. We got lumber and built floors for our tents and set up there and they built us a, the engineers built us a, a, a mess hall and uh, a um, place for the officers to uh, have a, a desk and so forth. I'd been sent to school while I was in Vietnam to Da Nang called the Nan Mai Warfare and Booby Trap School. So we were out one day and this fellow's foot went in a hole and his toe was caught under a trip wire. So I went over there and I backed his foot out and told everyone to back up and I disarmed the booby trap, you know, and I, I had it in my hand. And the skipper said, okay, let's, let's head in. So we're heading in and this thing is getting heavy. It was a big explosive device and I'm carrying it. So we cross this bridge and here's this huge river and I thought, ah, <laughs> which is wrong on so many levels, you know, so many levels. And the skipper turned around and said, what'd you do with that? <laughs> so there went my award, you know, my run star. <laughs> we do a lot of foolish things when we're teenagers. Finally, in uh, late December, why they, the word came out that we we're going to move to Tain In, Vietnam. And uh, the word was that we were going to move there uh, right after the first of the year to be set up by the end of uh, January. Well, I decided that we had set ourselves up twice already. So I said to my guys, all right, get some chainsaws. We're gonna cut our floors in, in four pieces for our tents and we're gonna load them on flatbeds. Well, that caused a lot of problems with the transportation battalion because it took four, four times as much transportation to move us than what it should have. I'll tell you one event that happened that I always tell people, I really don't talk a great deal about the war, uh, but one event was we were out in the bush one time and they, we came in and they said, well, get cleaned up, you know, get showers, shave, put on clean uniforms, okay? And then they had trucks come in, we called them uh, six buys, I think they're called deuce and a half now, and we got on the trucks and we went into uh, Da Nang, which was about 11 kilometers. Uh, and they put us on C-130s and they flew us to Cameron Bay. And uh, while we were on the plane, they said, turn in your ammunition. We didn't think much of that, you know, being uh, young Marines in a war zone. As, as it turned out, uh, President Johnson was coming to Cameron Bay and he needed some troops to stand out on the tarmac so he could review them. And they were quite concerned that one of us might shoot him, so that's why they took away our ammunition. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't know if you want me to recount that kind of stuff, but. <laughs> Some of the experiences that we had in addition to that was um, on one occasion, uh, one of my uh, warrant officers was a uh, artillery specialist and we had the mission of inspecting artillery units in our area. And we went into a 105 towed uh, howitzer unit that had eight guns. And my uh, warrant officer did what he's called a bore scope. And you take a, a camera and you go to put it down the barrel and it's all lit up and you can see what's inside that barrel. Well, in six guns out of eight, he found a lot of cracks. So he, he said, to, called me on the phone, he said, Captain Sims, he said, um, I'm gonna deadline these guns. He said, the next round that goes off on any of them could blow the whole battery up. So I said, okay, his name was uh, Warren Officer Jackson. I said, okay, Jack, do it. So I got on the phone to battalion and got a hold of battalion XO and I told him I said Major Falk uh, here's what's happening oh you put those guns back online Captain Sims I said no sir let me talk to the colonel well he's busy right now I said well fine when he's free have him call me so he got on the phone and I explained to him and he said well what do you think and I said I 
have a lot of faith in Warrant Officer Jackson because he has had 20 years in the service and he's four scoped a lot of weapons, so he knows what he's talking about. Okay? So he calls me back up, the colonel called me back up in about an hour and he said there's six guns in the air on choppers right now. By the end of that day, we had that whole battery back in line. Well, I, I, it, this is where you, we get the thousand yard stare, they call it. When you go back there, uh, which is the worst and the best job I ever had, both, you know. I was fortunate, I had some guys wounded, but while I was squad leader, I didn't lose a single guy. And I had a fantastic commanding officer, Thomas M. Pratt III, we called him Little Caesar. And he was a career Marine, of course. He got the name Little Caesar because he'd go to battalion meetings and they'd tell him, say, we, we want you to do this. And he'd say, no, I'm not gonna do that. That'll get my guys killed. Or we want you to go from here to here and this is the amount of time, I need more time. So they said, well, you're just a Little Caesar, aren't you? And uh, so that's how he got the nickname. But uh, I think he uh, wore it proudly. And in that process of protecting his guys, he kind of upset a few people and never went above a uh, lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps. Um, so without getting into the detail on Vietnam, I left there in August of 67. Uh, went back to Paris Island, where I was a coach on the rifle and pistol range. And, uh, you know, we always had, uh, we had the city boys and the farm boys, and the farm boys, they're pretty easy to teach how to shoot, you know, and the city boys, they would get so concerned, you wonder why they ever joined the Marine Corps, and some of them never held a weapon. But uh, then I got what's called a no hearing shit, and I'd, I'd been on the Rained for so long, my hearing got uh, not so good. And then, so they made me the NCOIC, the BOQ. Uh, so by that time, I was a sergeant in, in charge of the bachelor's officer's quarters. And, you know, not that long back from Vietnam, and I kind of ride herd on all the second lieutenants. So it was, Marine Corps was good, but uh, I decided to to get out because basically I really didn't, you know, I was 21 years old, still did not want all that discipline in my life. I went home in April of 1967 and got out of the military. Uh, and to be honest, uh, I've, the reason I got out is I didn't like the politics. As I, as I said, you know, war is the ultimate political act anyway. But uh, people in Washington cannot really run a war on the other side of the planet while trying to, as politicians do, keep everyone happy. There's a line from a poem which is very appropriate. It says, diplomats, politicians, and other practice liars call for pawns and guns to fan the frenzied fires. But personal experience, although many of my friends did have, I, I did not have. I was fortunate. I went back to my, my hometown, which was a small town. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was talking with my dad. Uh, <laughs> we're actually in a bar, which, which I don't really go to bars anymore. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But, uh, and uh, we were talking, and he had a friend sitting down the other end of the bar, you know. And, I said, this is my son, you know, he's uh, back from Vietnam and, and then out of the Marine Corps. And I said, he needs a job. And the guy said, I'll hire him. And so that's how I went to work on a railroad, but, which was my first job after getting out. But that's the way it used to be. You know, you have, you were comrades. I like to say, Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, they're all my brothers. We fought in different wars together. And I say that because uh, 
those who fought, fought for the cause of freedom, which is the only cause worth fighting and dying for. I went home and I thought about my guys for years. And finally, on the internet, I happened to see one of my sergeants looking for guys from the 548th. And I made contact with him, and this was in 2006. And by 2011, we'd found 18 guys through various methods. And uh, he, the, the one that I'd initi made initial contact with happened to find uh, on a cruise another GI that had pick, found a, a lady down in Texas who had a knack for finding people. Well, she went to work, and by the end of 2011, she had found 80 of us that were alive, uh, 30 uh, that were deceased, and 36 that we can't find. And in 2013, we had our first reunion, and we only 31 of us and our spouses made a reunion. We had it in Branson, Missouri. And at that reunion, one of my sergeants, and I may draw some tears here, presented me this pennant. And, and uh, with it, he said, I've had this for 45 years. And he said, I didn't know what to do with it. But he says, I knew it should go to my company commander. And you get a close up, there's a picture of him presenting it to me. So it's hung on my wall in my office here in Gastonia. And I decided that it shouldn't be there. It should be someplace where people can see it. So I talked to Jim and Jim said, yeah, I can do something with it. So he's taken and gotten it framed. And with it is the original note that Sergeant Jose Rivera gave it to me with. And there is a picture of him, the same picture that's on the bottom right hand side of this, presenting it to me with his the words that he had. And also there's a couple of pictures of the history of the unit of the company. And we had a reunion in 2013, which was the initial one. Uh, and they had one in 2014, but I couldn't go to that one. Again, I'm gonna tear up. Because my oldest daughter, who I'd left with my wife and a, and a six month old. She was 20 months old when I went to Nam. Was turning 50. So we had a party for her. So I missed that one, but we had one uh, back in September and we didn't get the big turnout. But looking back now, I was very fortunate that I never lost anybody while I was there. But many years later, quite a, quite a number of years later, the, uh, the dream started. Never bothered me for a while. And it'd be the same dreams, and every time I would hope for a different ending, and it always came out the same. And that's basically the definition of regret let an event over and over in your mind, hoping for a different outcome. Uh, I, I decided that I wanted to uh, do something to help my fellow vets with the same problems. So I was going to start a ministry for veterans with PTSD, help them find healing, you know, faith-based ministry. And I knew nothing about that, so I went online and I found a ministry called Point Man Ministries, which is all vets, faith-based, uh, helping other vets with the uh, emotional and spiritual wounds of war. 
and that's what I do now. I'm state coordinator for Point Man Ministries. We have about 200 outposts around the country. See, the problem is vets, they don't like to talk about things anyway, but if they're going to talk, they're going to talk to another vet. So that's why it's an all-veteran, volunteer veteran ministry. And we, we have, uh, we do a lot, but we have meetings, and even with other vets, it takes a while to open up, you know. And then in our meetings, we have the, the Vegas rule, you know, what, what's said in, in the point man meeting stays in the point man meeting. So after a while, they'll open up, and uh, it helps a lot. And it's not just Vietnam veterans. I mean, this was happening with, you know, Caesar's legions and Napoleon's army. It's been happening all along. And so after Vietnam, they gave it a name. They call it PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I used to made a joke. I said, uh, I know why all the guys ran off to Canada. And they said, well, why? I said, well, they had pre-traumatic stress disorder. But uh, so from Vietnam, it was called PTSD. And uh, Second World War, it was called battle fatigue. And First World War, it's called shell shock. And in the Civil War, it got what is perhaps its most poignant name, uh, which is Soldier's Heart. So right now, um, I use the experiences that I had in the war to, uh, I write about them and relate them to the healing process from the Lord. And that is, that's uh, pretty much my life now to do that. As I say, uh, my service time meant a lot to me and it's meant a lot to me to keep up with them. You know, I went to, uh, my grandsons wanted to go to Comic-Con. So I said, okay, let's go to Comic-Con and then, you know, I'm going to go with them, right? Papa's going with them. So uh, we went to Comic-Con and I've never seen so many people in spandex, but uh, I mean, there was enough spandex there to we revitalized the textile industry in the South. And they had everything you can imagine there. They had one guy selling t-shirts and you could get a t-shirt with your favorite superhero, you know. So I'm talking to this guy and we're talking about the, your, who, the, who your hero is, you know. And I told him all my heroes were on a wall. 58,282 of them. Of course, they're not the only ones. Every, everyone who has served this country is, in any capacity, is my hero.